Good morning, church. If you don't like it when I get political, you might want to leave right now. Are they gone? Listen, I'm not really going to get political today, but I'm going to look at a passage with you that uh, some political people have taken to mean exactly the opposite of how I'm going to uh, talk about it today. And so as a result, I just felt like I needed to give kind of a little bit of a caveat. Anyway, let's go into it. It's in Luke chapter 22. There's this passage that Jesus um, teaches his followers the night before he's crucified. So this is right after the final Passover meal they've had together. It's immediately after they've done the communion time, the foot washing time, all of that stuff. This is the evening that Jesus is going to be betrayed. He's already told them that one of them is going to betray him, and they are now on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. They're not leaving yet, but they're getting ready to leave. Anyway, it says this in Luke 22, verse 35. Then Jesus asked them, When I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. Now, just to remind you, this is Jesus referring to a time when he sent his disciples out to begin to spread the message that the kingdom of God had begun already. They were supposed to uh, cast out demons. They were supposed to heal sick people. And they were mostly supposed to just enter a town, and if they were received with hospitality, stay there, and if not, leave. And so Jesus said, you don't need to take anything with you. You can just trust that I'm going to provide and there will be someone in that town who will receive you or it's not a town that I've prepared for you anyway. So go ahead and move on. Anyway, so Jesus says, did you lack anything? And they said, no. So now in verse 36, Jesus said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, And he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. Now, those of us who know the rest of the story, not like the disciples back then, we know that when Jesus says it's reaching its fulfillment, he's talking about the fact that tomorrow he's going to be dead. He's talking about the fact that tomorrow he's going to be crucified, he's going to be killed, he's going to be laid into a tomb, And everything will reach its fulfillment. In fact, on the cross, Jesus does say, it is finished. And so anyway, we know that Jesus is talking about the crucifixion as his fulfillment. But he's also talking to his disciples in a sense that sounds like he's preparing them for the future. He says, now, when you are sent out, you need to take a purse. In other words, you need to have some money with you. You need to have a bag. In other words, you need to have some supplies with you. He says, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. In other words, people are going to be threatening you. But that's the line that trips people up a lot because they read this and they say, oh, uh, Christians are going to be opposed by the world. We're going to be persecuted by the world. And the way we need to deal with this is that we have to have our own money. We have to have our own supplies. The world's not going to just take care of us. We need to have our own money. We need to have our own supplies and we need to have our own weapons. It's more important to have a sword than it is to have a cloak. And so people read that and they actually use this passage to advocate the ownership of weaponry by Christians. They say Christians are supposed to own weapons because Jesus commanded us to own weapons. There's just a whole lot of things that are confusing about that passage for people who know the rest of the story. Because, of course, Jesus, he goes to a cross he, he, he doesn't defend himself. He goes to a cross. And so since he goes to the cross, we're wondering, well, are we supposed to defend ourselves? No, Jesus went to the cross and he's the last one who suffers. The rest of us are supposed to defend ourselves. That's what some people have interpreted. Christians should own weaponry of some kind so they can defend themselves. It just simply doesn't really jive. Because see, In verse 38, which immediately follows this passage that we just read, Jesus has just said they need to get a purse and a bag and a sword. And then this happens. The disciples look at Jesus and they say, See, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. And then the story continues. They leave. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where everything happens, including this weird thing where when Jesus is taken captive, one of Jesus' disciples, who happens to have a sword, 
draws the sword and uses that very same sword to slash the ear off of the high priest's servant. And Jesus immediately responds by saying, no, I could call down a legion of heavenly angels to protect me, but we're not going to do that. In other words, put your sword away and he heals the man's ear. What's weird is that Jesus said, get a sword. The disciples say, we've got swords. Jesus says, that's enough. They go to the garden. One of them uses the sword. And then Jesus accuses him of doing the wrong thing. Perhaps you're confused. Well, I'm going to raise your confusion just a little bit more. Jesus said that every single one of them should take this approach of bringing a purse, bringing a bag, and bringing also a sword. Sell your cloak and get a sword. Every one of them is supposed to have a sword, right? Until the disciples say, see, Lord, here are two swords. And Jesus says, that's enough. Here's the question. Are two swords enough for 12 disciples plus their leader? Jesus said it's enough. But he had previously told them they all needed to get one. So if we know anything about the disciples, we know that they never understand what Jesus is saying. If we know anything about the disciples, we know they are constantly misinterpreting what Jesus says. And if we know anything about Jesus' relationship with his disciples, we know that when they get his, his statements wrong, Jesus displays a little bit of frustration. Oh, Peter, why did you doubt? And to the disciples, why didn't you have any faith? And, and these sorts of things are the things that he says. Jesus in frustration in response to his disciples seems to be a commonplace occurrence. Is it possible the disciples misunderstood what Jesus said? And they're asking Jesus the honest question. Jesus, we've got two swords. And Jesus, in utter exasperation that they have misread him one more time, says, Ah, that's enough. Let's go to the garden. See, I think that's the way I would understand this passage. Because clearly two swords are not enough for 13 people. Okay, so Judas has already left by this point in time. So it's just 11 disciples and then also Jesus. But then we're told in the passage later on that there's a, a different guy who, in Mark, we know there's a, a young kid who's not a disciple and he's also with him. So there must be a number of people there beyond the disciples who are also with him. So, so maybe they need 20 swords. Jesus has just told them they all need to get swords and now they say, we only have two. And Jesus says, well, that's enough. It's enough for what? See, too often we misunderstand what Jesus says through the lens of our own sort of, well, that's the right way to put it, kingdom building perspective. See, Christians get this mindset that we're supposed to be building a kingdom, just like the ancient Jews felt. We're supposed to be building a kingdom, and building a kingdom requires certain things. It requires some battles. It requires some fighting. It requires some uh, things like this. And so we, we get into kingdom-building mode. Well, let me just remind you what Jesus said. In this same chapter, Luke 22, just a few verses earlier, when he is talking about what it means to be in kingdom-building mode. Verse 24. It says, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors, but you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who's at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You see, kingdom building in Jesus' mindset has nothing to do with domination, has nothing to do with force, has nothing to do with requiring other people to obey you and honor you. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm the one who should be sitting at the table, but I'm the one who's serving you. 
See, here's the point that Jesus constantly makes over and over and over again. You don't need to fight some kind of battle because the king, your king, is washing people's feet. This is one of the most amazing, profound, and confusing lessons. No one has ever gotten it all the way right. Jesus' disciples didn't get it right. The people who followed Jesus in the earliest century sometimes got it right and sometimes didn't get it right. And people, you and me today, still get it wrong. We live in a society where Christians feel like it's our job to fight for the kingdom when Jesus says, I'm wearing a towel and I'm washing your feet. Do you suppose Jesus really thought that it was going to be us against the world and we needed to prepare ourselves with money? Or do you suppose Jesus is the same Jesus who said, my heavenly father will care for you? Jesus, do you suppose he's the one who wants us to carry with us our own provisions and hoard our own provisions in case the world turns against us? Or is Jesus the one who would say, look at the lilies of the field. See how my father clothes them. Look at the birds of the air. See how my father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Do you suppose Jesus is trying to tell us that we need to take up arms and be ready to defend ourselves against the weapons of this world? Or do you suppose Jesus is the one who says, I'm among you as one who serves? Listen, there are some times, maybe not now, maybe not during this coronavirus thing, but there are going to be some times when you feel like your Christianity, like your faith, like your church, like your way of life is under threat. And we have an amazing privilege in our country here where we can speak our voices and we can take actions politically. We can take actions with regard to the votes that we offer and the letters that we write and the phone calls that we make. We have an amazing privilege here in this country to have an influence in this country. But is it a war? Is it a battle? Do we raise weapons, even metaphorical ones? Or do we serve? Because see, who's greater? The one who's sitting at the table or the one who serves? Everyone would expect the greater one is the one who's sitting at the table. But Jesus is wearing a towel. Listen, I'm not sure exactly where this lands for you, but I want to encourage you. Your job, my job, is not to fight for the kingdom of God. My job and your job is to be the kingdom of God. Where the greatest are those who serve. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, would you move in our lives and cause us to be people who would serve more than fight. Give us wisdom to know what that means in our political context today, in our world's context today. Give us the guidance of your Holy Spirit and give us the faithfulness that Jesus demonstrated to trust in the Heavenly Father even when the things in front of us look confusing and grim. Father, I pray that you would guide us that way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me encourage you to have a great day today.